Well, welcome everyone to Keeping It Local, a monthly program of the League of Women Voters of Champaign County. Uh, my name is Joan Towsey. I'm a member of the program team. Um, shortly, I'll introduce our featured speakers. The League, uh, has, of Champ the League of Women Voters of Champaign County has taken positions in the areas of human resources, natural resources, local government, and the judicial system. To support these positions, we host public forums and sponsor programs throughout the year to provide useful, timely information to members of the community. Although some might not be aware of these positions, and, and these may be amended over time, there is one in environmental protection that states we promote measures to encourage reuse and recycling of appropriate waste materials. The recycling industry worldwide has undergone many changes and challenges that have caused consumers to have concerns. Recent figures show that 94% of Americans support recycling, yet only about 35% actually do recycle. In a bit, we'll hear more about the approximate rates of recycling in our own community. The most common barriers to recycling are a lack of access, the inconvenience of recycling, and being unclear about how to recycle. Citizens generally want to do the right thing, but have questions. What better way to address the specifics of recycling than inviting experts in the fields working in this arena for the cities of Champaign and Urbana and our third sister city, the University of Illinois campus. Um, I'll re also remind you that some great material on local recycling programs and the do's and don'ts of recycling are posted on the league's website um, and much of that information came from our speakers. Let me now introduce these three experts in alphabetical order and with just a couple of sentences about each. Daphne Hulse is the Zero Waste Coordinator, Facilities and Services at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Daphne is a recent graduate of Purdue University. That's okay, we like Purdue too. With a background in environmental science. Her work at the university focuses on how campus can reduce the quantity of land-filled waste through source prevention and recycling efforts. She is currently focused on designing a green research procurement policy and investigating the opportunity for food and organic waste collection. Courtney Kwong is the Re recycling coordinator for the Public Works Department of the City of Urbana. Courtney has been coordinating the curbside and multifamily use cycle programs since 2002. During her tenure, she has developed a successful battery recycling drop-off program in 2011, establishing five drop-off locations in the city of Urbana. Uh, Courtney has also has been instrumental in the development of the countywide electronics recycling collections since the mid 2000s and provides community engagement workshops on backyard com composting and other educational campaigns and events in schools and the park district. Nicole Millage is the environmental sustainability specialist for the Public Works Department of the City of Champaign. Nicole joined the City of Champaign in 2013 as the environmental sustainability specialist. She oversees the city's multifamily recycling program, Feed the Thing. Some of her other duties include assisting residents with solid waste hauler issues, responding to public inquiries regarding recycling and sustainability, and co-hosting recycling and litter pickup events, administering a household battery recycling program as well. Since this is an occupation and field that many of us on the Zoom, particularly baby boomers, may not have considered years ago when we were making higher education career choices, and ones that even now we might see as areas that may have been occupied more so by men in the past than women. I'd like to start by asking our three panelists to briefly share how they entered this field. Uh, Daphne, do you mind if we start with you? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Joan. 
So as John mentioned, I am a recent graduate of Purdue University, graduated in 2021. And during that time, I studied natural resources and environmental sciences. I decided back in high school that this was the most important issue facing our society today. And that's why I felt I had um, a purpose to study that and then enter the field in climate change. Uh, I spent much of my time as an undergrad working in the political arena, uh, focusing on climate action advocacy within Congress. And I thought that's where I would head after graduation, but um, this opportunity at the university presented itself. This is the first time the university has funded full-time a zero waste coordinator as part of their larger climate action plan for the state. So I decided to pivot into a specific role within climate change, waste, and I feel that um, it's been a journey, an exciting journey, and it's been very creative and fun to sort of design this position as I go through it. Great, thanks, Jackie. Courtney? Good evening. Um, I started my career um, in Urbana. Um, I became interested in environmental issues uh, at a young age and went to the U of I for my undergraduate degree. Uh, at the time, there was a new degree called Environmental Communications and Education, so I was the first graduating student of that degree, uh, and that was through the College of ACES. Um, and uh, from there, I, I did some um, graduate work at Arizona State in environmental journalism, and then I uh, made my way to Urbana. There was an opportunity there for the recycling coordinator position. And I had done some research um, when I was an undergraduate about Urbana's program. So I was very excited about that. And um, so since 2002, I've been with the city of Urbana um, in this position and I really enjoy it. And uh, we've we've seen a lot change in, over the years and um, hoping to continue that change moving forward. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my path was a little different to get to the city. Um, I joined uh, there in 2013 after um, going back to school in Oklahoma and being on the Paralympic volleyball team for several years. I decided I wanted to move back to Champaign and um, start working full time and start my career. And I found City of Champaign and I came in as a project specialist. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just helped out with whatever projects that they needed help with at that time. And it so happened that in 2013, the recycling coordinator You're left. Um, the recycling coordinator left. So um, I started filling in and I just fell in love with it. And if there was anything I was gonna do at the city, that was what I wanted to do. So I kind of fell into the role, but I used my background um, having a business um, administration degree and going to grad school for business. I use that to help run the multifamily program. And so lately we've, um, in the past uh, few months, we also hired another environmental sustainability specialist. So she's gonna be helping out with other sustainability projects, stuff that I don't necessarily have the time for because I'm working primarily with the recycling stuff and working with Courtney um, on our electronics collections and um, working on different things like that. So we're excited at the city to have two of me now um, as opposed to one. That's great. Well, very interesting career paths for all three of you and um, something we should share with our younger friends as well. That This is a, a great career path. Um, just for everyone's benefit, we, we do have several questions, but feel free to add additional questions in the chat and um, Anne Panthen will be viewing those and letting me know when there's some additional questions. So here's a fairly basic question uh, for the three of you. How should recyclables be sorted? I can try to answer that. Um, it kind of depends on the program. Um, each of our programs might be slightly different for each um, city and also for the university. Um, I can, um, I'll try to share a screen of how recyclables should be sorted in Urbana. Uh, if you give me a moment here, I'll um, see if I can do a, a screen share here. 
uh, if that works. Maybe not. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Oh, she's she's doing a screen share. She's setting something up. Okay. Um, who, whoever is chatting there with a the lovely British accent, could you please uh, mute yourself? Um, and Courtney, if that's not working, uh, maybe just go okay. I'll I'll just speak on that. Um, mm -hmm. for some reason it's not coming up. I did try that earlier, but um, in Urbana, uh, so some of the just the main tips that we tell residents is for recyclables to be sorted um, to rinse all your containers. Um, so um, especially if it's something that um, has a lot of residue in it. So a peanut butter jar, for example, we ask that you kind of rinse out really well to recycle. If it's a soda bottle or, or, or a carton of milk, we just ask that you just rinse out some water and we'll still accept that in the recycling program. Um, in our program, everything is sorted by um, uh, it's not automated, uh, it's sorted by hand. Um, so a lot of larger cities have automated programs where they use machinery to sort all your recyclables. Um, in Urbana, it's actually hand sorted by workers um, through our contractor, ABC Sanitary, which is actually based in Champaign. Um, so we ask that for containers, for example, that you keep all the lids and caps on the containers. Um, so when they're going through the sorting process, which I can talk about a little bit later, those caps can be recycled into the proper um, bins. So some of the plastics on the soda bottles, for example, um, there's a plastic that's a so like a number five plastic on a number one bottle, which is kind of hard to explain, but it's just a, a number that's based on the chemistry of the component of the plastic or the plastic resin. And so we just ask people to leave the caps and lids on those containers in our program. And then the hand, the workers hand sort through all that uh, while they go through the sort line. Um, and then, then we ask all residents to place materials. So we have a single stream recycling program, which means you can sort your paper and containers in, and place it into the cart that we provide that, that's called a U-cart. Um, and the city provides each household with one of those. And also each apartment complex we provide uh, recycle toters for. Um, and we also have, and I had this on my screen, but there's an online recycling guide uh, listing acceptable materials. If you Google or type in urbanaillinois.us backslash recyclables, or just Google uh, City of Urbana Use Cycle Program, uh, our website will come up and we'll have some recycling resources there uh, on what can be sorted and what's accepted in the program. Thank you. Any major differences, Nicole and Champagne, from what Courtney has described? We all learned I'm, th I'm thinking something new about leaving those tops on the bottles. Who knew? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, that was very helpful. That's that's that applies for our programs as well. Um, the big difference, or I mean, the major difference in Champaign from Urbana is that we have um, single family um, and multifamily programs that are different. So the multifamily, um, the city oversees that a fee is paid by the property owners, just like you cycle, but it's just for multifamily property. We contract out to a hauler. And that hauler is Midwest Fiber Recycling in Urbana. And then for single family residents, right now there's four licensed haulers and they pick up um, garbage and then they cannot charge extra for the recycling services. It's built into the price that you pay for trash. Uh, some of them offer carts, uh, some of them don't. You don't have to use them. I know that one company charges to have totes delivered and you know, I just use my own totes at home, um, but our uh, hauler for, well, I, I think a lot of the recyclables for most of those companies besides maybe ABC ends up at Midwest Fiber Recycling. There's a transfer station in Urbana and um, after they go there, then they go to their facility in Normal. They are not hand sorted like they are at ABC. There's huge machinery that they use to sort everything. So it's quite fascinating. I've seen it. It's, I mean, it's just the biggest piece of machinery that I've ever seen, but they, I think they have 
um, videos on their website still that you can see how it all works as far as how it all gets sorted. Um, and they also let people do um, visits at their facility if anyone's interested in doing that. But it's pretty fascinating to see just how how it all gets sorted because there's so much stuff as you can imagine. But um, but yeah, that's the main differences is just that like Courtney has you cycle that covers all residents and uh, our programs differ a little bit from single family to multifamily. But the same idea of the single stream recycling and all of that and pretty much I think the same items that are accepted as well in both programs. Thanks. Daphne, do you want to talk a little bit about what happens on campus? And I'll yeah. say maybe particularly addressing dorms and which perhaps is a, a significant portion of what you're you're dealing with. Yes, correct. Any place where students are living or where you're having food production, you're going to see an increased amount of waste. So that's definitely the case with residence halls. Um, the recycling program is standard across the university. So what's recycled in the housing arena is the exact same as what you would find in any sort of instructional facility. So it is quite a bit different than Urbana or Champaign. And that is because we own and operate our own waste transfer station. So that means what we are collecting for recycling and then sorting out is different. Just like Courtney said, though, we are also a hand sort facility. So the more pre-sorting we can do up front, the better and the better outcome we'll have if we're dealing with less contamination, which is referring to any sort of food or organic waste material or oil that would seep into the good materials, such as fiber-based materials like cardboard or paper. Um, so around our campus, we work, we're working towards a standardization of separating um, recyclables into a variety of streams. In some cases, we also have single stream recycling. Um, typically, it's explained through the signage that we have on campus. We're working towards a standardization of three stream bins. So you have your landfill stream, your bottles and cans, and then your paper. Cardboard is collected separately um, based on facility. So we do have a source separation. I've also included in the chat a um, link to our webpage, which talks about what we accept for recycling different than the two cities. So it's important to note that. But Courtney has, Courtney and Nicole have already had uh, great additions here. Um, same with the caps. At our transfer station, we have a perforator. So leaving on caps on bottles is just fine. We're able to perforate and remove all liquid and air to compress into what we call bales, which is how we um, efficiently move recycled material from a vendor. What should never be put in recycling that maybe we, those of us at a certain age, tend to do more so than we should? Are there certain items that definitely should not be considered recyclable? Uh, I'll start off. Um, I would say um, big no-nos that sometimes we see end up in our recycle carts. Um, food or landscape waste, we cannot accept in our program. Um, things like pet waste or diapers can't be accepted. Um, wood or construction type materials sometimes end up, unfortunately, in our carts we, we cannot accept. Um, also a, a thing that's been um, talked about the last few months a lot is um, styrofoam. Um, since DART has closed their uh, drop-off facility for styrofoam, um, fortunately, we don't have a local option right now, uh, but um, sometimes we see styrofoam in their carts and we don't have the ability to recycle that at this time. Also things like hazardous waste, um, so oil, uh, gasoline, pesticides, um, things like that, um, even their containers. I get that question a lot, even if the, the, the oil container or the pesticide container is empty of product. Um, we still will not accept that in our recycle program. So I wanted to, that's probably a question I get quite frequently as well. Same with paint, um, even if the paint is completely uh, solidified and emptied in the can, that's considered um, a hazardous waste or a, a chemical waste that we can't accept. Um, also things like electronics, but we do have our biannual drop-off events for those. Um, batteries. Um, fortunately, Champagne and, and uh, 
and us in, in Urbana have um, drop-off locations for recycling batteries. And then finally, um, things like large plastics and toys. So things like Rubbermaid containers, unfortunately, um, even if they have a recycle symbol on them, which some of them do, we do not accept in our program. So our contractors only um, is able to accept materials that they can market and, um, and process and get processed, I should say. So um, even if they do have a recycle sy a symbol, sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean it will be, we'll be able to recycle it in our, in our particular program. Um, but if anyone else wants to join, jump in, Nicole and Daphne. Yeah, yeah, you did a great job of covering all the items for sure. I mean, one of the things that we always say is when in doubt, throw it out. Um, but also on the other side of that, Courtney and I both have uh, web pages, where do I recycle it web pages. So we tried to think of all kinds of random items that people ask about from styrofoam to to mattresses, to paint, to appliances. Like we have a whole page listed full um, of information of where you can bring those items, who might accept them for disposal, recycling, or donation. So, and I also always encourage people to like try to get rid of stuff on Facebook Marketplace or put it about by your curb. Like you never know what people will take. Um, so yeah, but Courtney did a good job of um, explaining all of that. And I think we're gonna talk about the electronics recycling a little bit later. So I'll just wait for that. Uh, Daphne, is styrofoam, or is styrofoam collected at all on campus? It is not. So we, mm -hmm. like the cities, use DART, as did the residents. That closed down, as we all know. So unfortunately, we don't currently have an outlet for that. I understand there were um, equipment in the past used at the university, but it was on a small pilot scale and no longer utilized. Um, on the topic of what is not collected for recycling at the university, I want to share my screen really quick. I uploaded a, um, prepared a slide for this. Hopefully it's showing on the screen now. Yeah. But um, this is a page here describing what the university does not recycle. So as mentioned, food and organic waste, not something that we can process. So different from the cities, just want to really emphasize that point. At the university, we're only collecting bottles, type one and type two plastic, which you can find at the bottom of a container. So at the university, we are not accepting three through seven. This is because, um, again, we are a different facility. We own and operate our own facility. And therefore, the vendors that we're working through, it's a market-based process. So we are reliant on what our vendors accept for recycling and give us money back for to help fund our process. That is why we are limited in the type of plastics we collect. Liquids, a, a really big form of contamination. Um, you can see here, this is a photo we took at our transfer station. So you can see um, a good piece of cardboard contaminated with tomato sauce. So that would render it no longer recyclable. Styrofoam, as we just mentioned, this was a recent addition due to the closure. Hazardous waste um, contaminated with food or oil. Pizza boxes are one I want to pick on really quick. This is um, one of those common misconceptions that if you have a pizza box, if it's been contaminated with a lot of oil or food, um, it's better to try and rip off the pieces that haven't been contaminated, maybe the tops or the sides, and try to keep that away from the side that's been contaminated. And lastly, Again, for the university, we are not able to accept any kind of hybrid material. So think like the juice jugs, milk jugs that are made of that Tetra pack or wax line coffee cups are another common one we see. So these are some examples. We have a ton of questions in the Q&A, and I was just able to pull some of them up. Um, and it's a little overwhelming. Um, and I might ask you to to. Um, cycle through it and bring up um, a couple of uh, the ones that are most relevant to where we've been in the meantime, because we're, we're talking about food waste, uh, maybe we should also have a brief conversation about composting, which it might be the, the obvious choice for food waste. Would uh, anyone like to talk about composting and the fact that maybe we don't have an actual program in place within the cities, but how best people might find out information on, on composting. 
Um, I can speak a little briefly about that. Um, so in Urbana, uh, we do not at this time offer food scrap composting um, programs. However, I do um, typically, um, it's usually every other year I conduct a backyard composting workshop with the Urbana Park District. Um, and in Urbana, you are allowed to have your own backyard compost um, uh, pile uh, and within reason. Um, we don't have any re regulations against that, which is nice. Um, and so we kind of go, we have a, a, a program uh, which kind of goes over and highlights um, some ways that you can easily implement a backyard composting um, program into your yard and uh, using food scrap and landscape debris. Uh, and um, uh, so there's different uh, ways of doing that. Um, if anyone's ever interested in that, um, this year we will not be conducting a program, but most likely in, in 2025, it's usually in the spring months, uh, usually in May, and um, those details would be placed on the Urbana Park District uh, program guide. So if anyone's interested in that, or they can reach out to me directly, um, and I think at the end we can provide our um, contact details, and I'd be happy to um, talk with someone regarding setting up your own backyard compost. Anything additional, Nicole, on composting and champagne? Um, not really. Courtney kind of covered it. We have some stuff available on the website about what people can do at home, but there's nothing on the horizon right now as far as a program. Um, but with our new um, environmental sustainability specialist, it is something that mm -hmm. she's uh, looking at or that we've discussed. So you never know what could happen in the future, but nothing, no plans at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daphne, anything along those lines on campus? Yes. So uh, <laughs> this is a multifaceted issue, as I'm sure Nicole and Courtney are aware. For the university side of things, um, the dining halls currently operate under a program whereby none of the food waste is wasted or goes to landfill. This is because all of the five dining halls on campus partner with the Urbana Champagne Sanitary District, which operates several anaerobic digesters. So these digesters um, capture a variety of material from the community, but from us, they capture our slurried food waste. So we are taking food waste that is created in the kitchens, as well as what's left on plates in the dining halls. They slur that up and then they take it to the sanitary district where they're able to capture the methane from that waste to heat and power the plant and then produce um, soil amendment, so soil fertilizer. So this is something that the university has begun looking into to um, essentially think about creating a similar facility, an anaerobic digester for the rest of the material on campus. Um, we have approximately 52,000 tons of organic waste produced across the campus per year. So not only just the food waste produced in dining halls, as well as what comes through the dorms, as well as all of the farms, anything coming from vet med, organic bedding, um, animal carcasses, all that's considered. So this is something we're looking into, really where we're struggling is finding the funding. I think it'll come from federal, but there's a lot of capital expenditure up front, millions of dollars, as well as the ongoing operating costs. So it's a very multifaceted issue that we're hoping to also work into. There's a, there seem to be at least a couple of questions about plastic bags, I assume, from grocery stores. Uh, besides taking them back to the grocery stores, do you have any guidance on how to best dispose of them? Uh, I can speak for Urbana. Um, in Urbana, again, since everything is hand sorted and it's not an automated process, um, like larger cities use machinery um, in which um, plastic bags are a big no-no to put in your recycling receptacle. In Urbana, we will accept um, shopping retail or grocery bags only in your recycling. So things like Schnucks or Meyer or Walmart bags, we will accept. Um, we don't take any other type of bag, like a produce bag or a newspaper sleeve and things like that. Um, but if you do have um, a retailer bag, we will accept that. We just ask that they're dry and bundled together, and then you can place it in your U cart um, and we will recycle those. Um, but typically that's not common in most municipalities. What's the proper way to bundle with string? Um, we, 
Um, oh, and I, I should mention when I say bundle, um, do you just if you have more than one bag, just to put all all your bags in one bag and just tie it together. Wow, gotcha. Okay. Nicole, anything specific to champagne? Yeah, plastic bags get a little tricky because um, like I said, a lot of our recyclables in champagne end up at Midwest Fiber Recycling where they're going through the machinery. So a lot of the plastic bags get stuck in the machinery and it causes problems. So they actually prefer that they not get plastic bags, um, but they do, I mean, they do accept them, but they'd prefer that people get rid of them through, you know, the grocery stores or dropping them off. And I know that somebody put a question in here about how do we know if the single use plastic bags are actually being recycled? I mean, the honest answer is we don't know that um, for sure. And so, but, you know, I'm hopeful that they're doing the right thing um, with what they say on there and getting them recycled. I think that's the best way to do it instead of putting them in your bin personally. We have several comments about pizza boxes and certainly with the uh, demonstration Daphne had of the cardboard with the pizza sauce on it, it, it would appear the pizza boxes of which there must be thousands daily on campus <laughs> continue to be an issue and probably not the best use of cardboard. Uh, how else one would get their pizza? I do not know. Uh, what qualifies as hazardous waste and do we have any hazardous waste recycling opportunities on an annual basis in town? I think you did mention hazardous. You did qualify that it's oil and that gas. So sorry, we did yeah. comment on that. But how how should one dispose of it now? Um, I'll take that question. I um, so we typically have a one day um, IEPA sponsored household hazardous waste event, and we were hoping to have another one in April, like we did the last couple of years. But um, the IP IEPA is having issues with securing a contractor this year. That's how we understand it at least. So there hasn't been any event dates set for um, this year yet. So we don't know if there will be any set. So right now there are like long-term permanent facilities where people can bring household hazardous waste. So we're talking like, yeah, oil-based paint, um, stuff that you find under your kitchen sink, um, stuff that you would use on your yard, chemicals, uh, pesticides, stuff like that. Um, there's long-term facilities. Most of them are in Northern Illinois. There's one down um, in Southern Illinois near St. Louis, I believe. Um, and so those are not great options. And we were really disappointed to not have a spring event for it because we know people really rely on it. So we just tell people to hold on to their items that they have until we have the next event and uh, as opposed to putting them into your trash. Um, but there is a group, um, a nonprofit group called Champaign County Environmental Stewards. And I would recommend going to their website. Um, again, that's Champaign County Environmental Stewards. And um, they are working towards the creation of a household hazardous waste facility. So that's very exciting. That's something that Courtney and I have been around since the inception of and working um, with them as advisors. And so that facility would be in um, Urbana on North Lincoln out by Republic's transfer station and hopefully available in less than two years now. So it's progress, it's something, even though it might take a while, um, they're getting there, so. But yeah, they have a website where you can find out more information and ways to donate and stuff like that. Thanks. Uh, Anne, do you wanna throw out a couple of questions um, if you think they're relevant to where we are right now? Well, you know, there's a lot of questions in here. How, how let's move to this one, <clears throat> excuse me. What would be some good questions about recycling for us to ask candidates for the general election? I think that is a good question. It ties into another one that I had here. Are there any legislative items in the local area around recycling that we should be aware of? So maybe we can address both of those yeah. in one fell swoop. 
Courtney or Nicole. Yeah. I can try to answer. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm part of a group called, um, uh, I'm a co-chair of a group called the Illinois Product Stewardship Council. And um, we work with legislators to pass legislations basically requiring um, product or producers, manufacturers to um, be, take charge of the end of the life of their product, um, whatever that product may be. Um, so one of the things that we're working on um, currently this year is um, trying to create a portable battery stewardship act, meaning essentially um, opportunities like we have in Urbana and Champaign for the rest of the state to have for residents to be able to um, easily and accessibly recycle different types of batteries. So single use batteries, lithium batteries, uh, rechargeable batteries. Um, so you can Google, I don't have my slides working, but you can Google um, House Bill 5348. Um, and that is the uh, the bill that's, uh, they had the first reading in February. Um, it's assigned to the Energy and Environmental Environment Committee, rather. Um, so if passed, it was established a product stewardship bill for batteries, um, like I said, including alkaline, lithium, and rechargeable requiring producers that are selling or distributing those batteries to participate in a battery stewardship organization. Um, so they would have to um, either work with retailers or governments to um, offer recycling programs for citizens or residents to um, participate in throughout the state. Um, and so I, again, that is H HB 5348 um, in the Illinois Gener General Assembly website, and you can learn more about that. Um, and that's one of the things that um, that I'm sort of part of that I would probably talk to people about. Great. Um, I'm assuming that you get good support from your county, your local governments in Champaign or Urbana. Um, are, 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 do you feel things are well funded uh, at this point with Nicole getting her second staff member? It sounds like um, the cities are, are taking this issue very seriously. Uh, are there other things that one that you, you're lacking at this point uh, in Champaign or Urbana? I mean, yeah, I feel like we're headed in the right direction with having the second position. And I think Samantha's on this call right now. Um, I didn't have her tag along um, simply because she just started and <laughs> I didn't want her to be too overwhelmed, but she's been well, welcome, me. Samantha. <laughs> yeah, Samantha, I think she's on there somewhere. Um, hi, I'm here. <laughs> oh, hi, Samantha. Um yeah, but she's been working hard on um, a grant for us and just figuring out, yeah, where she can kind of um, lend a hand and the projects that she can work on and just kind of getting familiar with the city. She came to us from Colorado, so it's, um, you know, a big change and it's a new city. So she's uh, learning and she's great and we're excited to have her. Um, if you want to add anything else, Samantha, you can, but I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> And Daphne has put in some information about SB 1555, which is different from House Bill 5348. Is that right, Daphne? Yes, this created a council, a statewide recycling needs assessment council. The IEPA appointed many different uh, important points of contact around the state to um, work with someone to create and a needs assessment to understand around the region, what are the needs for recycling? So this is huge. Um, the EPA, the US EPA helped fund this. So this is gonna be, I think, very beneficial throughout the state for um, better recycling infrastructure and just a better grasp on what we're dealing with. Excellent. Um, Daphne, well, while you're on there, can, can you uh, briefly mention your work on the green research procurement possible? policy and describe the purpose of devising this policy? Yes, I'd love to. So I do have a slide for this one as well that I love to put on the screen for everyone.
but you can see this one. All right. Okay, putting this on the screen now. So green research procurement. Um, procurement is referring to the act of purchasing something at the university. It's run through the state. It's a very bureaucratic process to purchase on this campus. However, many people have access. Students, faculty, staff, we're making purchases with university money. And in particular, the kind of money I'm interested in looking at is what's purchased for research on campus. So the purpose behind a procurement policy is no such policy exists in terms of when someone makes a purchase, are there any sort of guidelines they need to follow for sustainability? This is important because the further upstream you can go in the process of purchasing an item, the better chance you have to keep it from going into the landfill. So there's a reason why we chose research specifically. Uh, through the picture here, research is a huge form of expenditure at the university. In 2021, um, seven, more than $700 million was spent in some capacity on a research area. Um, we have more than 3,000 faculty each one of them are likely making purchases. Uh, much of the space on campus is dedicated to research um, through a variety of centers and labs and institutes. And this is also timely for us because back in 2023, the university formed a green research committee. So this was in collaboration with sustainability representatives as well as safety representatives. So we can work together towards a more safe and sustainable research arena. And secondly, because through those discussions in the committee, we came to a recommendation, a resolution to fund a full-time green research coordinator with the help of two student interns working part-time. So the goal here is to create a landscape study of the state of research at the university, what's being purchased, how frequently, is it a single-use item, is it durable, can it be reused? So the goal here is to try to reduce how much waste is coming from labs on campus. Sounds like a very important effort. Thank you. We want to see our tax dollars well used and student uh, tuition dollars well used. Um, Courtney, would you like to um, talk about the America Recycles Day event and how the general public can participate? Yeah, so um, I coordinate um, America Recycles Day event with the Urbana Park District. Um, we typically hold that event the first Saturday of November. Um, America Recycles Day is a day dedicated to highlight recycling in the U.S. and is typically, um, it's, 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 I should say, it's celebrated on November 15th. Um, and so this year, uh, we usually come up with a theme uh, for our events, and we encourage the public to come out to our events that's typically held at the Anita Purvis Nature Center in Urbana. Um, so once we get those details, we will be putting that online um, on the city's Facebook and website, typically in September. And we encourage um, all Urbana residents and also the community residents, Champaign too, because a lot of that is the same kind of information that the city of Champaign also has for recycling. So we encourage everyone to come and um, learn more about recycling. Um, we usually uh, uh, partner with the idea store um, and do some upcycling arts and crafts projects, um, depending our, on our theme for the year. Um, so um, again, it's usually the first weekend or first Saturday of uh, November. Thank you. Uh, there's someone who's anxious to have the following question answered. What percentage of collected recyclables actually get recycled? Any guesses? Well, we have, um, I'll just speak for Urbana. Um, I do, it's on our website, but I do an annual Urbana waste diversion report. And this actually includes um, not only just our commodity recycling, what we pick up at the curbside or apartment complexes, but also includes things like the landscape materials that are brought into the Lans Urbana's Landscape Recycling Center. Um, and we get um, we have hauler reports um, that we require haulers to um, give provide the city on how much they also recycle. So um, different haulers that are uh, licensed to operate in Urbana. Um, so in our diversion report, which kind of includes basically everything that's composted or recycled, 
Um, we have a rate of about 32% uh, recycling rate in Urbana, um, which is about the same as the U.S. national rate, according to the U U.S. EPA. Um, so we vary between 32% and 36% in our recycling uh, diversion rate, I should say, our waste diversion rate. Um, in terms of recycling in Urbana, I would say we recycle about usually about 85 to 90 percent of what comes in. And the other materials are just things that are um, either contaminated or we just don't accept in the program and there's no market for. So our contractor, unfortunately, just has to throw that away. Um, so that's basically uh, what we do in Urbana. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, I'm, I also collect, uh, reports from the haulers about, um, how much they're collecting. And I, in all honesty, I'm not confident in the numbers that I'm provided at all. Um, the one thing that I do recognize that, um, makes me feel good about the program is that the rates increase every year. So I see that as a positive, more people recycling, more people wanting to, more people learning how to. Um, I mean, I just know with my own family and friends, there's always someone new that, you know, wants to get started. And so I help them out. And that's basically what I try to do my, with my role at the city. Um, I did notice one of the questions here says, um, is there any place to recycle Christmas lights that don't work? And so I thought that would be a good time to bring up the residential electronics collection event. Um, we have a biannual event. I work with Courtney. And then we work with Champaign County and the Village of Savoy. Um, and we host the events out at Parkland. So maybe some of you are familiar with it or have attended, but uh, the online registration for it opens um, for our spring event opens on Monday. And I'm going to put the website here in the um, messages. And um, people can get registered starting Monday for a 15 minute time slot to drop off electronics on Saturday, May 18th, between eight and noon. And um, we're, we usually have anywhere between 1700 and 2000 people that drop off electronics on that day. And we do the online registration now because it keeps things running smoothly and we don't have the long lines. And you know we've had some nightmare events that we've had to learn from um, so everyone appreciates the registration, um, system, but we do accept, um, non-working holiday lights at those events. And there's a whole list of accepted and non-accepted items on that registration website and, um, holiday lights. There's other places that accept it, um, year round as well that you can find on both of our websites. That would be one of those items on our, um, where do I recycle it webpage. Um, and then I saw another question that I thought I should briefly mention. If you don't live in city of Champaign or city of Urbana, if you live in a village or a town, well, first of all, everybody can use the electronics collection event that we have in Champaign County. Um, but if you don't have a recycling program in your village or your town, um, the only public drop-off that's available right now is Illini Recycling. Um, and that's out on Paul Avenue off Market Street behind um, Marketplace Mall. And so they accept a lot of items, but they unfortunately do not accept glass anymore. And that's because it's um, heavy, it's, it's hard to transport, they don't make a lot of money on it, so they don't want it. But glass is something that still is accepted in both of our recycling programs through the cities. So I just wanted to mention though that Alina Recycling is the only free public drop-off that's available right now for anybody outside of city limits. I'm also going to thank Kate McGuire and is Kate from the sustainability effort? Is that the right name? Because she's answered some people's questions or Emily Ernst's questions. So assuming that Kate is a good resource, thank you for taking the time to answer some questions that ha has to do with recycling numbers three to seven. And I'm not sure that we've addressed the numbers much and if if anyone wants to quickly uh, talk about that. I can talk about that. So in Urbana, at least in Urbana, we take plastics one through seven. Um, numbers one and two um, usually have higher market rate prices. So basically our, um, our 
the ABC Sanitary, our contractor, acts as a broker. So if they they try to get the best price for the product that we we that people recycle. Um, we do take three through seven um, plastics, and typically that's kind of combined into kind of a mixed plastic category. Um, for example, some of the plastic ends up um, in the past, it ends up in a, a, a drainage tiling. Um, there's a place called Haviland Drain Drainage in Haviland, Ohio. And that's one of the places that some of our plastics kind of end up in the past. Um, so we try to, most of our plastics that we, we collect are, they're all domestically, not only domestically, but I should say they're sent to different places in the Midwest to be processed. But number three, three, I should three through through seven is typically harder to recycle, but there are markets for for that. And we'll find out more information about those numbers on the handouts that you had supplied ahead of time. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Nicole, would you like to talk about the multifamily recycling program, Feed the Thing? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, it's for um, any apartment or sorority or fraternity that's got five or more units um, or group housing. Um, so, you know, I, I see a lot of questions on here about plastics three through seven and um, when I ask our hauler Midwest Fiber Recycling about that, like, are these really being recycled? Um, you know, what's happening with those people, you know, ask me about that a lot. I mean, Midwest Fiber Recycling is a recycling only company. So they're in the business of getting everything recycled that they can and turned around. They are not in the business of, you know, spending money towards the landfill, so they want to make money on everything that they can. So that gives me a lot of confidence in, you know, um, what they're doing as far as, you know, making sure that everything gets recycled. But, but yeah, the the program though, especially with campus, can be very challenging because there's so much turnover with students, and uh, just kind of keeping up with things can uh, definitely be uh, challenging, but I often have students reach out and they have questions or sometimes I don't even know that they have the recycling bin out by their garbage, you know? Like sometimes, yeah, the first step is just learning what you have, but uh, I always try to provide them with whatever education I can, or we have five gallon indoor buckets that we provide a pond request. We have those at Champaign Public Works as well. You can come in and pick them up at any time. It's just a five gallon kitchen bucket that you can put use to put your recyclables in and then toss the recyclables into the outdoor bin. They don't need to be bagged. Uh, they usually prefer them not to be bagged actually. Um, sometimes if they are bagged, they'll just assume that there might be garbage in there and you know, if it doesn't get broke open during the sorting process, then it could very well end up in the landfill pile, which we don't want. So loose recyclables is good, but, um, but yeah, and I provide residents with recycling stickers if they need those for their bins, um, as well as uh, reusable bags if they want some really good heavy duty reusable bags. Um, or the grocery store, for going to the library, whatever it is, um, I have those available as well. So that's all on the website. There seem to be some questions and comments about how interesting it sounds and um, in terms of maybe visiting some of these facilities. Um, and there are also some perhaps uh, folks interested in whether internships are available at any of your uh, uh, locations um, as we are nearing the, the end of our time here, would, would you each three want to comment on those two items, internship possibilities and tours of recycling facilities? Daphne, um, you want to maybe take that first? Yeah, so we do offer sustainability internships at the university through a variety of different subject areas. Zero waste is one of those. Um, Currently, we do not have any available right now. We just filled all of those with some new students. Um, but every every year or two, we, of course, there's a, a transition as students eventually graduate. So those do open up for sure. And secondly, with 
tours. I'm putting a link in the chat here. We do offer a tour of our waste transfer station. It is on campus um, in Champaign, so you can feel free to fill out a tour. You do not have to be affiliated with the university to tour this. Um, it is just an educational piece um, to explain our process and hopefully give you insight about what recycling looks like. Thank you. Courtney. Yes, so um, we use ABC uh, Sanitary as our contractor in Urbana. Uh, currently, they are not conducting any tours for the public um, at this time. Um, it's a small facility. Um, it's a tight facility. So they're um, it's a very small scale. So at this point, we're not doing public tours. Um, in terms of internships, um, the city uh, hasn't recently offered specific for recycling or sustainability internships. Um, sometimes um, my sustainability uh, manager um, has um, opportunities that he uh, meets with students for, but um, we haven't had an internship opportunity recently for, for Urbana. Thanks. And the cool. Um, yeah, like I put in the chat here about um, looking up Midwest Fiber Recycling's uh, website and asking them, I'm pretty sure that they um, offer tours um, to the public. Um, they, Like I said, they did have a cool video on there um, showing the process as well. And it used to be like live or something like that. But um, as far as internship, we have not had an intern in quite a few years. I think, I feel like it was one of those things that um, COVID kind of, uh, mm -hmm. we stopped doing and just didn't get back to doing, but um, it is a possibility in the future. Super. Well, as we um, head towards, well, eight o'clock your time, nine o'clock my time, um, I'm wondering if you could, each of you just kind of give a, a one kind of bullet point to to summarize what you think is the most important takeaway uh, that you'd like to share with the group. And why don't we uh, start with Nicole? Um, let's see, I didn't have time to think here, but um, I would say that if you have more specific questions about certain items, I mean, I'm constantly reaching out to our recycler to be like, what about this? And what about this? Like I have questions about items all the time as well. Um, I have our electronics recycler on like my speed dial. And he, anytime I have a question about some random item, he'll answer it for me. Let me know if they accept it. So it's the same with the curbside program. There's a lot of, I know, um, unknowns. It's not all black and white. Um, if you do a tour, like Midwest Fiber Recycling, you can talk to the people more on the front lines and, you know, ask them the specific questions about um, certain items, um, or you can always ask us and we can talk to our hauler as well. Um, but yeah, I know that um, it can get a little confusing. And so I want to be a resource to help people. And um, I might not always know the answer, but I will work hard to try to find the answer for people. Super. Thanks. Daphne? Yeah, so I want to reiterate that recycling is an important practice that we should all engage in. But beyond that, there are many things that come before the word recycle. We think, reuse, reduce, repurpose, repair, and never underestimate the significance of mindful consumption. Think about all the opportunities you have for reusable coffee cups, reusable grocery bags, and your purchasing power as a consumer should also not be underestimated. That was very well put, Daphne. Thank you. Courtney? Yes, and um, I would say that everything you do does make a difference. So uh, like Daphne said, you know, we reducing um, consumption um, and every time you recycle, you are making a difference. Um, just this year, for example, in Urbana, we uh, I should say last calendar year, we um, had our highest uh, rate of recycling for both our curbside and multifamily programs. So we recycled about 3,800 tons of recyclables that were processed. And um, so I'm very proud about our residents for, for making that happen. And um, just want people to know that you are making a difference. Um, we do process those materials um, and uh, it provides a livelihood for many people. And, and we really appreciate that. 
Well, thank you so much to these three excellent um, panelists who are extremely knowledgeable about the environment and their uh, specific areas. Um, as you I hope picked up on, there's a lot of collaboration go that goes on uh, amongst uh, certainly Eric Champagne and Urbana and Courtney and uh, Nicole and Daphne now in her new role, I'm sure will be even more involved in things uh, as it happens in the community. So thanks so much to, um, to the three of you and let's give them a round of applause by clapping. Sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions, but the time was limited and hopefully we addressed most everything. Thanks so much. And uh, if you're not a member of the League of Women Voters and you would like to join us, you'll find more information about that online. Good night.